We move on with the next presentation by Reverend Father Vincent Kundulam. The balance of theologian in the post-truth era. I think that would be the better expression to introduce Father Vincent. The balance of theologian in the post-truth era. When many of us would be happy to fight with RSS, here we have Father Vincent, who would initiate an ongoing dialogue with the RSS. And over the years, as a theologian, he has found meaning in initiating such dialogues, not only with RSS, which was his uh, PhD project, but in the course of his uh, career as a theologian in the church, he has been initiating dialogue with uh, a, a spectrum of people, and he has found it more effective for theologizing. And today, Father Vincent invites us to have a discussion on learning and unlearning in theological education. I think this is vital for us, especially unlearning for many of us, the consecrated. I now invite Father Vincent to talk to us on learning and unlearning in theological education, particularly in the context of Indian consecrated communities. Over to you, Father Vincent. Good evening to one and all. First of all, uh, I sincerely thank the organizers and especially Father Saju for uh, making me a, a resource person, I won't say, but for making me part of this evening reflections. And uh, it was also a pleasant experience to listen to our Father Joe's and uh, Dr. Shalini, both of them good friends of mine. And uh, uh, it is a long time that I met them in person. And uh, my dear other uh, participants, uh, I hope that uh, even though I have not written the text, the lecture I am going to make would be clear and uh, understandable to you. In the beginning, I have only one uh, fear or I am just to feel that I am inapt to speak to you or because I interestingly now notice that I alone is a non-religious person in this group. Uh, you are all religious and consecrated. I don't know whether I am consecrated. I think so, but not very much religious, I think. Anyway, that's a pleasant initiative that you took to listen to uh, a non-religious man, uh, the so-called secular man. Uh, thank you very much for this, uh, for making this dialogue possible. And uh, as it is proposed, my topic is, is unlearning is essential constituent of a learning process. I'm just to modify my topic a little bit. Uh, learning and unlearning in theological education was the topic given to me or fixed earlier. But I have only one point to share with you that I have, I would like to articulate in this manner. Unlearning is an essential constituent of learning process. I refer to some of the dictionaries to grasp well the meaning of the expression or the vocabulary, the term unlearning. And what I have noticed there is this. It is coming out of old shells of knowledge. Discarding something from our memory. Why there is a need of unlearning? Because at a certain moments of our life, we realize that what we had learned earlier are incorrect. And so we have to erase it from our memory. Shalini was speaking, or she initiated her reflections with some experience. I would like to also begin my reflection uh, 
from a concrete question which i started asking me while i studied in philosophy in alway my professors who had very ardent faith very good professors they were very good communicators but especially when i learned philosophy i remember uh, two of them taught me nazism and existentialism and uh, while they were referring to nietzsche albert camus uh, karl marx people like them they gave a very negative picture about these philosophers so i realized that i had nurtured in me a certain antipathy or enmity even towards these people because in my discussions and in my speeches i had become very very defensive and uh, as i said i had cultivated a sort of ill feeling against these philosophers but while i reached in paris for my studies i came to read some of the original works of albert camus and nietzsche and karl marx also and then i realized that these people are not uh, so bad as my professors told me especially i was caught up by the expression of karl marx you no know, religion is the opium of the people but while i read the his works while i understood the context in which he coined such a formulation i told to myself if i were in his place i would have done the same i think karl marx was questioning the way religion responded to the situation of injustice and poverty always invoking uh, a sense of obedience towards god who is very transcendent theology in a way was curtailing people to react to take positions to question the structures and i think i would have done the same so from that moment onwards i started realizing that there are many things which i have to unlearn i started understanding theological process as a process of unlearning from that moment onwards later i had several occasions to i would say erase many of the convictions and perspectives which i had incorporated into my mindset into my frame of mind through the process of theologizing i think one of the challenges today theology faces today is nothing else than to make our students and researchers understand that and even our people that what do we say about god about man about world or all the topics that we deal with in theology they are not absolute truths that we communicate we communicate only one perspective nietzsche he has coined that expression you must be familiar with that multi perspectival vision he says our mind cannot have access to the real facts but only to their interpretations the so called facts are laden with bias presuppositions and limitations therefore man can aspire only for a perspective of truth i think one of the perspectives which we should erase from our memory while doing theology and while teaching theology is this what we teach is only a faith interpretation of some of the revealed truths i insist upon this because in today's postmodern world the greatest or one of the biggest challenges that we face today is we speak 
a normative language while the audience and the secular world critically opposes such a kind of narratives let us leave a space for individuality and plurality in our theological discourses i again refer to soren kierkegaard i think centuries back he already realized that all our communications ends up in massification of knowledge the press the writing the newspaper all publications try to create a world of uniformity and i think that is the danger in which we are in today in theological world especially in indian theology i feel that there is only a uniform language a few decades ago in india we had a space for pluralistic thinking in theology a multi perspective attitude was there but now i feel that the theological discussions which take place between bishops and theologians and even even the audience sometimes become very very orthodox defensive apologetic and there is a new theology which is entering now a neo apologeticism is baptized today in kerala in many circles and in seminars there are papers presented on neo i would say it is a neo classicism neo thomism and a a defensive theology is coming back which he had shut down out in the medieval age so this is one danger which i see for the future of theology in india today so uh, this is one point why or what we should focus on today in our process of theologizing as a part of unlearning i think we have to avoid a uniform language create a space for pluralistic languages avoid the danger of massification and uh, elicit in our students a multi perspectival vision my second emphasis or focus is on the way or the approach or the attitude with which the theologians face today the challenges emerging from our secular society or from the non catholic world i think the church is more tuned with or very comfortable with an attitude of radical opposition which theologians did with regard to science a few centuries back with the galileo especially and uh, i think we have to come out of that radical opposition because that gives no fruit to anybody we see the other as enemy this happens today with regard to media with regard to other religions with regard to other sects and uh, some of the even responsible people in the church enthus our young priests who have been had been formed here in our seminaries in a very pluralistic and universal outlook to become very apologetic and to defend be defensive and the images they cut across before them are those i would say fanatic people fanatic inter uh, people who intervene very radically in a very orthodox way in any with inimical language and even with ugly language in social media and i would say at the same time in our attitude towards the challenges coming from outside and inside the church we should not have also a very liberal attitude a liberal adaptation is also equally dangerous an attitude of indifferentism that is also very much kept by many theologians many theologians keep a mum or they keep a very pol- very polished style 
very diplomatic style. I would call them hypocrites. They change the theology accordingly, according to the context, according to the people to whom they speak. They don't speak truth. They even speak lies. That is, they make pretend that they are speaking truth. I think Saju was referring to postmodernity and post-truth age. And our theologians have become all the more very people belonging to that group of post-truth age. So I very clearly said our attitude should not be of a radical, should not be of a radical opposition, a neo-orthodoxy as it happened in the medieval age. We can never solve the issues of today and the solutions of the church with the solutions which St. Thomas had already discovered uh, centuries back. So we have to come to a constructive attitude in doing theology. That is the thing which we have to unlearn. When we were children, we were taught many things. At that time, we were not able to distinguish between what is the message and what is the form. What, is, what, are, the, what are the essentials and what are the non-accidentals? But today we are grown up people. We have learned what is phenomenology. Jesus was a phenomenologist. He always helped people to delink the non-essentials from the essentials. And he took people to the inner world of ours, inner world of things. And phenomenology is going to the essentials. And today, I, I am afraid if we theologians and the philosophers and the religious don't help people to go to the inner spheres of our religion and spirituality, the time is very ahead that the youngsters especially and the new generation will simply ignore church. And that is happening today. And that will become more and more. So what type of attitude and perspective or approach we should take in, as theologians towards the challenges that we face from the secular world? It should be of a mutual fecundity. Theology has something to learn from the science of the time. Our secular people, atheist people, they may be speaking a language unacceptable to us, very inimical sometimes. But the prophets always speak in that language. The other day I was participating in a talk show and I was in the midst of atheists and an Arasas Prajarak and a Muslim fanatic and an anti-Muslim also, who became an ex-Muslim. And there were, fortunately, a few humanists. You know, it was a catastrophe, uh, in fact, to dialogue. Dialogue was always impossible. I feel that in theology today, there is only extremist languages heard. The language of the medium people are not at all heard. Saju was qualifying me as a balanced one. Anyway, I don't know who can... Uh, really strike at the balance. Anyway, I feel that I am trying to keep a medium. But the medium languages are not needed for the people today. In the media, in the Catholic circle, circles, in theological circles. So, I am a little bit, I would say, fed up with the doing theology. Now, a third point. I think while we do this, enter into this process of unlearning in theology. We have to also revisit our methodology or pedagogy of doing theology. For earlier, we are all used to a top to down theology and we are familiar with the procedure. We always start with the revelation or the biblical revelation or the text from the authors, church fathers, and then we uh, try uh, to make people understand their positions, make them assimilate what we are say saying. And later at a stage, perhaps sometimes there will be a question answers. And then we come to the concluding part where we speak on, about how to apply these intuitions into concrete life. I think this methodology of deduction and the top to down methodology is no more functioning. That alone, I won't say that is totally 
uh, impractical or not needed we need it but i think we have to start from or begin with a down to top approach uh, approach our kaldrana and all the theologians pongar and many others all they had promoted this down to top methodology in second vatican council but we have just finished only 50 years after the council and now we are moving the opposite direction again we start with inputs we ask people to assimilate very little discussion and we speak about application i think we have to take the reverse project let us start with the context let us start with an exposure i think shalini was speaking about that uh, she was taken into different slums and different areas of life and uh, i think we have to start with exposure in our teaching theology in communicating theology and then let us analyze with the help of the people the affected the victims let them allow us questions let them be let us be a co traveler and accompany accompanist together with them to reflect over the situation i think we have to start from that context and then go to the time of jesus to see how jesus was responding how church fathers were responding why how early church was responding how our fathers uh, of the church were responding to the issues of their time and then let us engage in a dialectical dialogue between people with the victims with the people concerned and today there is no discussion in such levels again we are going back to a pre vatican era unfortunately i don't know fortunately fortunately we have a bishop we have a pope who always makes discourses following this down to top methodology we were believing that earlier i have heard many times in order to have a change in the church there should be change at the top but today what we see is there is a change at the top but the down persists so i think both are needed top to down and down to top it should be a dialectical process of these two pedagogy uh, pedagogies perhaps i will conclude with a last notion of the very understanding of theology itself why we were children or why will we were doing theology in our formation period we might have understood theology as a bundle of doctrines because there are so many ologies anthropologies cosmology uh, the christology ecclesiology all the ologies gave the impression that theology is ultimately a bundle of doctrines but today in the post modern era we rediscover that christ was not a lawyer was not a doctor of theology in that sense he was not a dogmatician he was a man of narratives he was speaking from the experiences he did theology from the experiential level and beyond all theology is a lifestyle if theology is disregarded discarded by the people today we have given a very false impression about the theology something which has become very conceptual very abstract nothing to learn from i have heard many people saying today especially charismatics are accusing saying that don't learn theology you will lose your faith that's a very wrong impression they got i don't know whether they have really delved into the real way of doing theology i feel more and more becoming more and more spiritual i feel and religious if you understand the religiosity and spirituality in the right way if spirituality consists and theology consists in taking standard some stands some positions with jesus it towards the issues that we face in the world i think theology has to be a lifestyle so 
i think i have to stop here now it's time i was trying to uh, explain to you or share with you only one point without unlearning we will never become theologians unlearning is essential for our process of learning theology so i again thank you very much each one of you for your patient listening i think you have listened to me you could hear me and uh, we will have further live discussions and exchange of views of course what i is i have shared with you is only one perspective so there opens a chance for dialogue and uh, i think i hope to learn many things from you thank you very much